there! Welcome to Grumble Dangs, where it's a great dang to have a good dang. Table for... 11? Okay, 11, right this way. Alright, there you go, here's some menus. My name's Michael, I'll be serving you tonight as that what? Todd, I really don't think. My name is Magnificent Michael Mustang with Mustard. And I'll be taking care of you tonight. Did you get your Grumble Dang's Grumble designations off the wheel of alliteration when you came in? Is that no? Okay, well maybe when you leave. Uh, I'll give you folks a few look at your menus, alright? And one of your children is flipping me off. It's gonna be a long night. Hey folks, have a chance to look at our drink menu, have you? We do, we do have a couple specials tonight I feel like I should inform you about. We have Teeny Tim's Peppermint Teeny, which is peppermint schnapps, vermouth, and olive juice with a little crutch as a swizzle stick. Uh, we didn't do a lot of holiday business this year, so we're uh, trying to get rid of all that schnapps. <clears throat> well, we do have the, the, if you're not interested in that, we do have the Lesser Antilles Mama, which is like a Bahama Mama, but different. We just can't say how. Americans, right? Geography, that's hard. Um, we also have the um, Staten Island Iced Tea, which is like a Long Island Iced Tea, but instead of vodka, tequila, rum, gin, triple second cola, it's made with Blue Nun Wine, Bud Lime, Moonshine, Moxie Soda Pop, Tap Water, and half a bottle of Amaretto we found under the bar with no lid and the head of the bottle sealed poorly with masking tape. Is there anything in there? No? Okay. Eleven waters. Okay. Not a problem. No pop lemonade? Okay. Eleven waters. Got it. Uh, in the meantime, we do have some live entertainment for you tonight, so sit back and enjoy. I'll be right back. Hey, I just flew in from 15th century Florence, and boy, are my arms tired. Now, it was a hand crank helicopter. Why do you think it took me 600 years to get here? I am Poggio Bracciolini, best known to history as the longest-serving secretary to the Pope of the Italian Renaissance. Um, I prefer to think of myself more as a Florentine who just happened to work in the Roman court. Um, if you think, being in the Roman Curia as a layman, Surrounded by politics, surrounded by clergy, getting paid basically nothing is a terrible job. Uh, you would be right. It was. It's what motivated me to write one of the first European joke books published in 1483, which, uh, hey, my material might be 600 years old, but I'm hoping my talent is a little more immortal than that. Uh, talent, man. In the Roman Curia, talent, honesty, these got you absolutely nothing. If you wanted anything, you needed intrigue, you needed a lot of luck, and you needed even more money. All right? I, I had a friend who was a priest, lovely man, he was studious, he was conscientious, and he couldn't get anywhere. He watched men far inferior to him get promoted up above him, receive all the dignities he coveted, and he was sore and sad and mad. And he went to the Cardinal of St. Mark, Cardinal Angelotto, and asked, demanded, why? Why do I see these men so far beneath me get promoted above me? I strive, I study, I have merit. I'm worth 10 of them. Why? To which Angelotto replied, here, the Roman court. Merit? Learning? These mean nothing. Take heart. What you need to do is use your time well. Use your time to unlearn much of the good which you know and to learn much of the bad which you do not. Then maybe you'll be acceptable to the Pope. Which, hey, let's not give Angelotto too much credit, right? The day Pope Eugene made Angelotto a cardinal, the priest Lorenzo traveled home laughing, rolling with mirth, just jolly as anything. And his neighbors were concerned. 
they went to him and they asked, did you not despise Angelato? Did you, did you not say he was mad? How, how can you be so mirthful on this day? Did, did some great fortune befall you on your journey home? Because to which Lorenzo replied, of course I could be sanguine on a day when fools and incompetence and madmen are, are made cardinals because Angelato is more crazed than I am, which means I should be made a cardinal any day now. It was always like that around the Roman court, right? Uh, I remember one day I saw the Cardinal of Naples leaving the Papal Palace. Papal Palace. The Cardinal of Naples leaves the Papal Palace. Say that five times fast. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, Cardinal of Naples leaves the Papal Palace, and he is rolling with laughter. Now, he was a large, ignorant, illiterate man, but he leaves the Papal Palace just laughing, overflowing, and I need to know. And I ask him, what is the source of your merriment? What is so hilarious to you? To which he replied, I'm laughing at the fool of a pope who made a cardinal of a blockhead like me. You know, though, you can deal with those folks, right? That's just, they're there, you deal with them. It's the hypocrites that were always the worst, right? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? They, they, want, they want all the dignity and riches, but they feign and they dissemble so well that it's the largest imposition you could possibly give them. Uh, take Paul of Pisa, so-called Paul the Blessed, because of his saintly demeanor. <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he would beg door to door for food. And there was a young widow who thought he was quite attractive. And so he would linger in her doorway and she would give him food. And then the next day he would linger in her doorway and she would give him food. And then one day she invited him in and she laid out before him a tremendous supper and asked him to feast. And so he did. He gorged himself on all the food there. And as he finished, she sat upon him with embraces and with kisses. And she said, Paul, you cannot leave until you have lain with me. Oh, Paul resisted, but she pressed. Paul resisted, but she pressed. Paul resisted, and then said, Since thou insist upon doing this sin, committing this sin, I want God to witness that the guilt is thine alone. I will have nothing to do with it. Take my cursed flesh, do with it as thou pleasest. I shall not even lend a hand. <sighs> Attractive priest, though, right? It's a thing. There's a reason people talk about that. Uh, in my hometown of Terra Nova, there was a young man, uh, rustic. A rustic young man, um, raw hand, raw hand at lovemaking. Uh, but he took upon himself a wife. And one night during their amorous conversation, uh, his wife put um, her anates in eus gremio. Right, right, yeah, mm hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, bow was bent, shaft was shot. Perchance it hit the mark, and our clodhopper was downright amazed and a little confused. He asked his wife, D do, you, do you have two? Two kunos? Do you, do you have two? She uh, thinks for a moment. Um, yes? Oh, 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 well, one is enough for me. Two, two is just excess. Well, the wife thinks for a moment. And the priest is rather attractive, so she has a rejoinder. We should give the second one as alms to the church. The vicar will appreciate it, and since you said you only need one, you won't even notice it's missing. All right, a young man thinks about it for a few moments, and... Well, making the priest happy be good. 
and I don't want to be greedy. So, yeah, sure, let's do it. So they invite the priest over for supper, and they explain the offering he is about to receive, and he is quite receptive. The church is uh, very thankful. Uh, so after supper, the three of them go to bed together, the wife in the middle, the husband to her front, the priest behind her. And the priest, uh, seeing this long-coveted dainty just right there before him, fires first. And the wife gives out a little <sighs> sigh. And the husband, a little worried that his, uh, his territory is being trespassed upon, cries out, Friend, remember our bargain. Touch not my allotment. To which the priest replies, I care not for what is thine, so long as I get to enjoy that which belongs to the church. Thank you. You've been a great audience. Have a good night. I tell you to buy my book, but I've actually wanted to be rich. I would have joined the priesthood. Fuck you. Oh. All right, folks, here are your waters. Can I introduce you in some appetizers? Maybe some well, I'm glad, I'm glad you asked, sir. We actually just updated our menu. You know, word on the street is millennials are killing chain restaurants. It's all anybody's talking about. So we're just trying to keep up with that, okay? So we have our brand new appetizers. We have our Netflix and chili, which comes with a side of an unusable tube of KY jelly. And uh, a, brand, a brand new appetizer, maybe you'll like this one. It's uh, the NFT, which stands for Navy Beans for Two. What? what? What's that? Well, when was someone going to tell me? Okay. okay. Thank you, Todd. Uh, it turns out NFT now stands for Nachos for Thanos. I don't. Todd, that doesn't even make sense. They're the ones eating the nachos. Are they Thanos? What is... So can I, I can't, can I interest you in any, oh, just the waters, okay. Sounds good, I'll give you a chance to look at those menus. I think our next entertainer is taking the stage right now. I'll be back. What you want me to do about it? It's not. No, if you're, I don't know any better than you do. No, I rode separately. I don't. I don't know. The cotton track. I don't know where they are. I tr I tried. You tried. I don't know what to do. I can't play by myself. <laughs> oh.
Tequila! All right, folks, here is your basket of fries. Careful, they're hot, just a little hot. Uh, can I get you anything else at this time? Oh, you brought, oh, you brought your own ketchup. Oh, that's ma um, magnanimous of you uh, to not use our ketchup. Oh, is that, is that Hunt's? Oh my God, I haven't seen Hunt's. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Are you sure that one basket is enough? I, it's just that there's a lot of you and your, and your next to youngest child is calling the Department of Defense to report me as an Al-Qaeda sleeper agent. That's, what a scam. Kids, am I right? Kids. Um, well, we've had, we've got some more entertainment lined up for you. It's a real human interest story. Really, tear up your heart. We think you'll, think you'll love it. Uh, so I'll let you chow down and watch the entertainment and I'll check on you in just a little bit. What? No, I don't want to talk to Lloyd Austin. No, I, what would I even say? To, how did you get, oh, how did you get the Secretary of Defense on the phone? What? You know what? I'm gonna, gonna go away for a little while. Climbing Everest is a selfish, selfish act. My friend Bob is a selfish man. He took that trip. And now, Bob's lost. I got the call. The chopper left me off base camp. Couldn't fly any higher. There's no atmosphere or the lift for the rotors. They dropped me off at the Motel 6 up there. I got a brochure for the Zippo Museum in Bradford, Pennsylvania. And I also got this map, the map that Bob would have used for his path to the summit of Everest. God, I'm cold. I should have worn gloves or something. I, I really didn't prep. I don't, I don't have a go bag, but it sure would come in handy. But uh, well, I think we can go this way. I, I can't read Nepalese, jeez. God, it's cold. God, I don't, I don't even have a mask. <sighs> yeah, fine, but wait. It's, everything's white. I can't read Nepalese, screw this. So I screamed, Bob, Bob, Bob. With the torrential flow of the snow landing on the ice and the glaciers, you probably can't hear me. I must trek on, but God, I'm frozen. The beauty of the mountain was intoxicating. And then all of a sudden, I saw him. I saw Bob. I knew, I, I, I had to get to him. It's something. Sure, I'm, I'm freezing, but it, but but I gotta get to Bob. It's it's it's. There he is. Oh, thank God, Bob. There's no movement. There's no movement. So I slapped him and I hit him. And then I slapped him again, like a '70s guy in the mustache putting on aftershave. No response. Nothing. But wait a second. He's not gonna need these clothes anymore. But there's still a chance. I hear. C can you breathe, Bob? Can you can you hear me? I think I think you can, Bob. Bob, that this, that scarf is soft. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the irony. Life is good, after all. Hmm. Hmm. He's about my size, and I'm freezing. He's not gonna need this stuff, right? No, 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 no. Gotta check. Check. Make sure he's okay. But that clothes looks like it's gonna fit. You know, life is good. He's coming back, right? All right, folks, ready to order? What do we feel like today? A basket of fries. Okay. One basket of fries for the uh, for the eleven of you. I, that's usually a side for one person. I see your youngest is crushing crayons into our new carpet, irreparably damaging it. So maybe a kid's meal, something no, to occupy him. No, no. Okay. Um. Well, uh, just to let you know, we do have some new menu items. I don't know. Maybe you'd be interested in those. We do have uh, the TikTok tacos. Uh, they're perfect for taking a picture of and immediately forgetting. We have the corned beef hash me outside Todd, really? No, I don't care if corporate... 
We also have the chicken a la tiger king. Todd, that makes it sound like they're eating tigers. I know. He doesn't care. Um, that comes with a side of gangyam style twice fried sweet potatoes. Todd, sweet potatoes aren't yams. So any of those catch your fancy? It just just the fries. Just the best fries. The one that's good. Okay. Well, to tide you over, we do have an exclusive new movie trailer for you, part of our new corporate partnership with Magnavox. So uh, enjoy. I'll go put in that order right now for you. I'll be right back. We were happy once. You were always there for me. I'd come home after a hard day of work, and you were there, waiting for me. Always. I'm still here. I'm not going anywhere. I know. That's the point. It's always the same with us, day in and day out. And when I drop the ball, you're never mad. You're just right there, as if nothing happened. I don't understand. Isn't that a good thing? No, I mean, yes, but look, I just can't do this anymore. It's gotten stale. I just need some adventure. I just, I need to move on. But what about our son? Sorry. <laughs> you deserve better. I know it's rough right now, especially being a single parent, but you'll get through this. I just... I still love her. And I just want her to come home to me and our son. Surprise, folks. How we doing on this fries, folks? All gone. All gone. Well, oh, Jesus Christ. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, between eleven of you, I can imagine. What's uh, what's this? It's uh, uh, it's the tortillery. It's uh, a periodic intervals. They have a real cannon and they shoot very sharp nachos. Very pointy nachos into the audience. Into the Customers. I told them it didn't make any sense, in addition to being very DANGEROUS! Tortilla has- the yells make a Y sound, artillery doesn't, that's not- How, how are we feeling about dessert? You just had the fries, you gotta, you gotta bring for a little more, right? We have the, uh, Harlem Milkshake? Oh my god. The, uh, 
Maybe not that. Maybe the uh, chili ice dish. Is that a Billie Eilish pun? Is that what that's supposed to be, Todd? No, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any kind of sense, Todd. It just tells you. It doesn't even tell you what the dish is. It just tells you the temperature. It doesn't. Okay. You, any of that interesting? No. Okay. No. And you have a coupon for a free basket of fries. Where did you get that? That's very specific. Okay, you ate here before, and you ate the entire meal, and then complained that you were dissatisfied with it after you ate the whole meal. Okay. Well, all right. Um, well, let me go ring up the check. I know we've got one more piece of entertainment for you tonight, and uh, we'll take that coupon off, and we'll get you out of here, okay? It was 4.32 p.m. on a dismal Friday afternoon. I languished in my poor, dirty excuse for an office. Watching the second fritter away like so many portions of meat, seafood, fruit, vegetables, or other ingredients that have been battered or breaded and then deep fried. It ain't easy being a private eye, but then again, no one ever said it would be easy being a private eye. Name's Molly. Molly McIntyre. Like Reba, but with a different vowel. Some might say I'm cynical, misanthropic, and hopeless for an American girl. But then again, they haven't been picked last for dodgeball, as many times, as I have. Or whatever we play in the 1940s. Hitting the rolling hoop with a stick, I don't know. I was about to close up shop for the weekend and get roaringly drunk in a dumpster behind an underground juke joint or a seedy waterfront warehouse, when she walked through the door. Her eyes were as blue as indigo crystal diamonds encrusted on a depressed iceberg on a cornflower lake, and her legs were twice as long. Her hips sashayed like some kind of sexy sidewinder making its way across the Saharan sands of the cool Moroccan night. Wait, that simile was kind of good. Her hips sashayed like a wino staggering home after a three-day balloon unbender. Only her hips didn't stop to throw up mostly in the gutter and partly on the shoes of a man who turned out to be a duly elected alderman. There, that's more like it. What's your name, Fasadil? I mean, what's your face, doll name? I mean, Humpturbajit Worcestershire Marshmallow Draconian Point? My name is Mrs. Jillford, but you can call me Mrs. Jillford. She was clearly lying. Dames always lead, especially about names. Especially about dame names. But I could tell she meant business. I mean business. My lunch bag is missing, and you are the only one who can find it. Are you sure? There are a lot of private eyes in this town. Yes, I tried them all first. I see. Absolutely all of them. Got it. I have no other option, I want to be very clear about that. M-M-H-M. I don't know if I'm being adequately blunt about how little I want to hire you, but you're quite literally the only private eye willing to take the case in this entire city. So it's yours. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed American girl is king, I guess. One-eyed men? Did she suspect a cyclops? No, I reassured myself. I had known a Cyclops once, and he had given me a back rub. A free back rub. Cyclops is good people. 
Are you okay? There are intermittent periods where you turn to look at the wall and just stand there, staring straight ahead, not saying anything. After turning to look at the wall, I just stood there, staring straight ahead, not saying anything. Maybe, if I stayed still, she'd go away. Dames have bad eyesight, like Cyclops. Cyclops is? Well anyway, you should find my lunch bag. I'll give you like a buck, if you do. That's like two bucks in 1943 dollars. Hot mustard crackers on a tar roof shingle. I'll take the case. If you find it, you should tell me at some point. I'll be somewhere until sometime. I hated to see her go, but I loved to watch her walk away. Mostly, because she had been pretty mean to me, and her leaving meant less meanness in my general vicinity, but I had no time to consider such things. I had a case to crack. It was raining again. It was always raining in this city. In fact, the storm drains were constantly overflowing because of all the rain, spilling the dregs of the sewers into the streets above. Filling the urban hellscape with the stifling, noxious fumes of rotting sewage. God, I loved it. Turning onto Waybot Avenue, I knew exactly where my first stop would be. Who the hell are you? Ah! Where's the lunch bag, shit for brains? I don't know what you're talking about. Maybe a fistful of love lead would jog your memory. I had no gun, because much like Batman, I don't believe in firearms, and also, because this is a piece of software designed for children, also much like Batman. I always let my fists do the talking instead. My mouth likes to punch people. Please don't hurt me. I mean, hurt me anymore. I have a homely wife and three fairly hot children at home. You should have thought of that, before you stole Mrs. Gilford's lunch bag, brains for shit. Mrs. Gilford? That's who put you up to this? That way brought is bad news all the way down. Do your research, before you wantonly destroy my home next time. What, if he was telling the truth? I did, after all, invade the first office I found and ransack it for no good reason. I had a lot to think about. I stepped out of Ricky's penthouse apartment and onto 467th Street. The rain fell hard, as hard as creating a cogent and evocative figure of speech to describe hard rainfall. I pulled out my package of cigarettes, intending to smoke, 
because smoking is cool. If anybody tells you it's not, call the cool cops and have them arrested. But I digest. Before I could light up a cancer stick, a familiar silhouette stepped out of the shadows. It was my erstwhile business associate, Dorinda. What the hell kind of name is that, anyway? Even now, she remained both an enigma and a mystery. Little birdie told me you're looking for a thin message bag! Hey, it's missing. Like you're missing gerund endings. Whoa, Molly! You always were a needless pedant about grammar! And you always were a heartless bitch. Molly, Molly, Molly! Jealous as always! Jealous of what? Your new career as a contract killer? No thanks, I'll keep my head above sea level, thanks. Suit yourself, Angel Cakes. You never did have what it takes to run with me. Why cock fury boiled up inside me, like the hard-boiled nature of this nourish tale. M-M-M. Hard-boiled eggs. I can't eat any because of my diverticulitis. I'll just have my eggs poached, thanks. What? I realized quickly that Dorinda couldn't view my inner monologue. I screamed into action. What do you know about lunch bags, anyhow? Why you asking me? Why don't you go talk to Little Balls Mahoney? Little Balls Mahoney. Another old associate of mine. The most dangerous and volatile member of the Scotch-Irish mob. MMM. Scotch eggs. I can't have any. You know, diverticulitis. Mahoney had a deep-seated rage aimed squarely at the heavily furrowed forehead of the world gone mad, owing to the widespread recognition of his rinky-dink nads. Dorinda was trying to set me up, that much was for certain. Little did she know, that little balls owed me a favor after the time I bludgeoned Minnesota fats to death with his own cool cue. Or did I do that on my own? Who may know? Well, it's been real, it's been fun, and it's been neither real nor fun. Later, toots. I stepped into Little Ball's headquarters and shook off the rain outside. The sewage was running ankle deep in the streets, but hey, that's the price you pay to live in the city that never sleeps. Wow, the city must be really tired, I thought. When I get that tired I get cranky, like, when I drink too much of Olkin and start to act out. Get some rest, Illyria, Ohio. Little Balls was waiting for me, like an attentive, diminutively knotted guard puppy who loved corned beef. Upon second thought, that's just a normal puppy. I made a mental note to work on my labored noir metaphors, after this case was cracked. Hello, Molly. It is really great to very see you. As I struggled to decipher Little Ball's impenetrable Irish robe, immediately I sensed that something was wrong. Little Balls never sat down, as he was already extremely short and did not want to appear shorter. Wait. Gasp. It was a trap. Not wanting to be trapped, I sprung into action. Molly McIntyre. Come out with your hands up. We have you surrounded. Oh no, the cool cops. The jig was up. Did somebody call for me? No. Go back to 1776. I can't. I'm scared of Felicity in Jipers. 
I said do it. That's a 10 to 4, good buddy. Suspect is having an argument with a hallucinatory villain from the colonial era. Roger that, move in. I sat in the cold jail cell curiously decorated like a 1940s child's bedroom, thinking about how it had all gone wrong. Why hadn't it gone right? Mrs. Jill Ford slunk in like a fun fat ale slinky slinkily slinking its way down some sexy slinky stairs. Wait, was that yes, she was holding the lunch bag. She had it all along. Cyclops, why? Firstly, that's a poor excuse for a callback. Secondly, I wanted you out of the way, so that I could have the lunch bag all to myself. What? I didn't know there was a lunch bag, until you sashayed in and told me about it. Exactly. It's foolproof. Okay, Molly, you're free to go. What? Yes, Jiggy and I paid your bail. Oh Jiggy. I always did like him. I guess there was only one thing left to do, have a nice, cool, great tasting cigarette. Molly, no. The sewage fumes. Hey folks, just checking into okay, they're gone. They're gone. And this oh, oh, and they left the coupon, and it is homemade magic marker. And on the back there is a crude caricature of me doing unspeakable things with Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. You know what? You know, Todd, I quit. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? I'll show I'll show you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be a bird. Deuces! 